in essence, I, like most fly fishers, perhaps carry way too many fly boxes about my person, especially if I'm doing a trip somewhere overseas and, or somewhere you haven't fished before, you always think, oh, I, I just might need this, I might need that, something like that. So, so it's all too easy. In fact, I, I carry a pack with me. This is more for photography kit and staying out for long periods, but it, it, it does house a lot of fly boxes as well. But we can, in essence, condense it down. If you look at a given river, you fish one or two rivers, you get to know that river, the flies you expect to see hatching. It's the same for me in my neck of the woods. And again, we, we, that's quite evident on the chalk streams as, uh, as well. So I'll talk you through the season. The early season would consist of the fly hatches of large dark olives and March browns. Obviously for the large dark, one of my favorites, just um, uh, actually it's in the Fulling Mill range is, is the PP Paul Proctor Pearly Butter Merger and that is absolute dynamite when trout are knocking off emerging large dark olives and the duns as well for that matter. So that's a good good one. It's a generic fly as well. Uh, you can tie it in 12s, 14s, 16s and 18s and it'll cover everything from uh, in a size 12 and olive upright down to a 16, a blue winged olive, a 14 would be a large dark olive. We also do it in primrose, so in the smaller sizes of 16 and 18, it covers pale wateries. So immediately off that one fly, you can see you, you've covered quite a lot of hatch scenarios. Again, for the March Browns, we can use the same fly on a size 10, tied in, in a tan colored body. But then moving it on, we've got the Granum, which are about now, certainly in my neck of the woods, and I fully expect to see them down here on the chalk stream. Granum are a diurnal daytime hatching caddis, which plays right into our hands because a lot of species of caddis actually hatch under the cover of darkness right through the night, in fact, and it's easy to miss them. We're, we're simply tucked up in bed or last orders in the pub if you like as well. So the uh, the, the granum actually uh, hatch through the day, they prefer a, a day like today, I've said that now and you watch I'll curse it, um, they like a little bit of sunlight and they hatch off and we patterns for that there's a couple again in the fully mill range which I absolute go-to's for me at this time of year and that's the granum emerger in, in green and cream. We do the stillborn again in, in green and cream. So the emerger works when the flies are hatching off and the trout you'll see, you, you'll know instantly when granum are hatching. First of all you'll see adults sort of skipping and dancing on the surface but the trout move with a degree of urgency to snap them up because when these caddies hatch they're all away quite quickly on the wing so the trout will move quickly it'll be like this eat, swing to one side and you'll see a definite bulge of water. The stillborn caddis which we tie again in, in or have available in the uh, green and cream are for trout feeding, essentially we called it a stillborn but it, it can be for adult granum that have uh, perished after egg laying and that tends to happen late afternoon and into the evening. You Still days, warm still evenings are best for that. It doesn't happen every evening, it can be hitty missy. But the stillborn then, that, that's when that would come into play. Again, you read the rice form, that, that, that because the actual adults are now dead, the trout know they don't need to hurry to, to gobble them up. So they move quite slowly and with purpose and you get, that's when you get those nice sipping rises and that nice when they eat. Um, I love that sound. <laughs> We all do as fishermen, it turns us on. Moving it on, obviously we've got mayfly. Now, I've done quite an extensive range for fully mill on the mayfly, quite excited about that. Everything from the nymph, the emerger, the adult dun, and obviously through to the spinner pattern. Mayfly is a big celebration on the chalk streams. In fact, for us, rather worryingly, I'll digress a little bit, um, they're appearing further north, on, further north on our more rocky rivers. Reason being we've got sediment coming into the rivers and that sediment is a, a, a hotbed or is the perfect habitat for mayfly nymphs. As we know, they're a silt burrower. So they burrow into the silt and develop there. We're seeing that more on our rivers and, and clearly more, more mayflies. A lot of people will think that's great. I enjoy it too, but it's also uh, an indication of the environment changing or the habitat. Yes, yeah, so back to the mayflies. The early days, obviously mayflies are quite a mouthful for trout. And initially when those mayflies appear, 
trout can be a little bit intimidating. That's when the nymph works for me best. Obviously fish will be feeding on nymphs, lifting up in the surface. Again, if you've got the luxury of clear water, which we have on the chalk stream, you'll see fish, fish moving about, fidgeting, eating nymphs. And then we can look to the emerger. I like emergers a lot, essentially, not just in mayfly patterns, but the others like I've mentioned the granum, I've mentioned the pearly butt. The reason I like these style emergers and, and they appear a lot in my fully mill range is because the hook actually anchors itself, it digs into the surface. That's got two pluses for me. The first one is because it digs in a wee bit more, essentially a fly is less prone to scare, so there's less likelihood of drag. Secondly, because it's partially subsurface, it's much easier for the trout and grayling for that matter to intercept. They're not actually breaking the surface, they can just inhale it. So I tend to get better hookups with that. Moving on into summer, we can look at the blue winged olive now. We get them down here and, you know, hooray, we, 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 they're still uh, very much in evidence in my, my neck of the woods up north. And the blue winged olive's qu quite a significant part of our fly fishing calendar because it's come to summertime now, we've got the warm days, they prefer hatching off in the evenings. And the beauty about blue winged olives, not only do the nymphs emerge in open waters, but very much like the mayfly spinners, uh, blue winged olive spinners come back and egg lay in open water. And consequently, after that, they die. Carcasses uh, drifting down the river and the trout are out feeding on the spinners. So I've included in, in, uh, in, in the fly range, uh, and, and two of my favourites is the high vis duster, paraduster. Obviously it's got a wing that's very visible so it can be seen at low light levels. And then we've got the, uh, the essentially the spinner of the same ilk with a very visible wing, fluorescent wing. Uh, we're able to see that and they're, they're, they're absolutely crucial for, for the summertime fishing. As we move into autumn, we can perhaps look more at, at, at sedge patterns to some degree. Again, people always make the mistake of associating just high summer with caddies. There's lots of species that, that we'll see right into the back end, September and October, and we can actively use with confidence and the likes of an elk hair caddis or a small caddis emerger. So what about nymphs? We mentioned earlier uh, that we can look to pheasant tail nymphs, uh, hairs ear nymphs, they're great. Every fly angler should have those in the boxes. There's two of my favourites and two of my go-tos if you're unsure of A, what's hatching, and B, they're great for searching the water as well, just as a generic pattern. We can build on that though. We can look at a case caddis, for example. They're uh, often, uh, certainly early spring, a lot of our species of caddis construct this uh, protective uh, case from tiny bits of grit, sand, twigs, reed stems and the likes, and we use a case caddis to imitate them. They're available early season. I'm digressing again uh, from the chalk streams a little bit because on our rocky rivers often we've got spates coming through and this flood water washes out these case caddis and that's a prime time for us to use a case caddis. So ensure you've got one of those in your fly box. We want some caddis pupa or caddis grub. There are a couple of caddis grubs that are free swimming. The two typical species that I'm sure many of you will be aware of are hydropsyche and rhicophilia. Both of those are what we term free swimming caddis, build uh, little constructions of uh, webs und under rocks and things like that. The reason they construct a web is to catch other small insects because they are carnivorous by nature. Quite sinister really, but we need we need some uh, caddis grub imitations. We also need some caddis pupa imitations. Again, there's one I've, I've just put into the fully mill range, which is absolute dynamite when caddis pupa are being predated on. So another couple of essentials would be shrimps. And I say another couple, because there's two shrimps I use. We look at the natural shrimp and it, it's obviously camouflage. So it, it, it matches the, the substrate. It's, it's tan, it's green. They can, obviously, they've got the ability, very much like a chameleon, to assume the, the, the colour of the background that they're the living on. So where does the pink shrimp come into this equation, for example? I'm a big fan of pink shrimps, and I always look at it uh, like this. You're making your fly, A, stand out in the crowd, B, offering it something different. And again, colours like pink work 
when we've got a little bit of turbid water. We see that on the chalk streams as well as on my rivers when we've got flood water. It, it can be quite mucky and uh, you want something that bit more obvious to stand out. So a pink shrimp or an orange shrimp for that matter and then a more natural shrimp. I'll be honest, the more natural coloured shrimp, be it olive or tan, for me probably outfishes the pink shrimp. However, <laughs> how much of that is percentage wise, how often have I got the tan coloured shrimp on the leader rather than the pink shrimp? Perfect exercise would be to go out with one of each and see which the trout prefer. So I know we're on the chalk streams here uh, and uh, generally uh, an upstream rule needs to be observed. However, again, certainly uh, on other rivers uh, further north, one tradition or style of fishing, spider fishing or north country style of fishing is very, very evident. So you need a range of, uh, of spider patterns as well. The, but the, again, the pearly, pearly boat water and blower, it's my sort of elaboration or interpretation of uh, uh, the famous water hen blower. A black spider, I do one, again, uh, a take on the black magic. It's got some pearly uh, iridescence in there. Greenwell's Glory is another good one. Snipe and Purple, absolute dynamite. They're, they're just four that, that really ought to be in your box for spider fishing. All of a sudden, this what have we got? We've, we've spoke with the dry flies and the nymphs and the spiders were probably looking, I've mentioned perhaps 15 different patterns there. All of a sudden you can see the list is expanding. Now we haven't discussed canish yet. We haven't discussed green fly or aphids. We haven't discussed the likes of alder flies. We haven't discussed things like, and we get them on rivers, damselfly and damselfly nymph, a dragonfly nymph. We haven't discussed stoneflies. Suddenly you can see that one fly box expanding to two, to three, to 10, to 20, and we're back to that 20 fly box situation. But, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, it's nice to try and trim down. That's where I'd like to go in the future. Next time we're talking, will you see me with two fly boxes of 22? Who knows?